the deadly protests in Iran, and whether we're closer to war with North Korea. Then fire and fury hits Washington with bombshell allegations. And Steve Bannon's attacks on the Trump family lead the president to distance himself from his former top advisor. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. We'll sit down with Mr. Trump's first campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, who continues to be a close advisor to the president. It's a Fox News Sunday exclusive. Plus, new reports the FBI is investigating the Clinton Foundation and that Mr. Trump tried to head off the Russia probe. Everything that I've done is 100% proper. That's what I do is I do things proper. We'll ask our Sunday panel which side is in more legal jeopardy. And our Power Player of the Week, getting to know the nation's doctor. For my entire life, I've tried to use the gifts that God gave me to improve health. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. President Trump and Republican leaders met at Camp David this weekend to plan their legislative agenda for 2018. But that was overshadowed by a new book about the president that reports some of his top advisors don't think he's up to the job. Coming up, we'll get reaction from Corey Lewandowski, Mr. Trump's first campaign manager, who remains in close touch with him. But first, CIA Director Mike Pompeo, who briefs the president on the nation's most pressing intelligence matters. Director Pompeo, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Great to be with you, Chris. Good morning. Let's start with the book. The author, Michael Wolff, reports that almost everybody on the president's team uh, on, in his cabinet question whether the president has the mental and emotional fitness to be the commander in chief. Here he is. They say he's um, a, a moron, an idiot. This man does not read, does not listen. So uh, he, he, he's, he's like a, um, he's like a pinball, just, just, just shooting off the side. As CIA director, you give the president his daily intelligence brief almost every morning. What do you see? Yeah, the, those statements are just absurd, Chris. I mean, just, just pure fantasy. My, my personal experience, I was with the president yesterday at Camp David. I'm with him almost every day. We talk about some of the most serious matters facing America and the world, complex issues. The president is engaged. He, he understands the complexity. He asks really difficult questions of our team at CIA so that we can provide him the information that he needs to make good informed policy decisions. And I've watched him do that. I've watched him take the information that the intelligence community delivers and translate that into policies that are of enormous benefit to America. Statements like the one Mr. Wolf made about uh, how, how we all think about the president, just, they're just ridiculous on their face. They're, they're frankly beneath the conversation this morning, Chris. Well, but it is the conversation, so I'm going to... Only because you, you made it so, sir. Well, no, I understand that. Well, I didn't make it. Michael Wolff did. And, and the country has, and to a certain degree, the president has by responding to it so directly. Fitness to be president. I, completely fit. I mean, I, I, I pause only because it's such a, just a ludicrous question. Right? This, these are from people who just have not yet accepted the fact that President Trump is the United States president. And I'm, I'm sorry for them in that. And we're going to move on with our mission at CIA. We're incredibly focused on keeping Americans safe. And things like this book, frankly, are, are, are just passing, passing moments in history. We'll get on. We'll do the people's work. And America will appreciate the good work that we do. I, I want to press on a couple of more points. I promise we'll then get on to your day job. The author quotes an email that was supposedly representative of the view of one of the president's top economic advisors, Gary Cohn. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Trump won't read anything, not one page memos, not the brief policy papers, nothing. He gets up halfway through meetings with world leaders because he is bored. Now, back in May, you were quoted as saying that one of the ways you keep the president engaged in your intelligence briefings is with, quote, your words, killer graphics. Yes, absolutely. I love killer graphics, too. So do you, Chris. You use them on your screen all the time here on the show, right? It's how you convey information. This president reads material that we provide to him. He listens closely to his daily briefing. Uh, different presidents, indeed, the previous president didn't receive his briefing in that same way. He didn't take a daily briefing from his CA director. Bo president Obama chose not to do that. This president is an avid consumer of the work product that our team at CIA produces, and we do our best to convey that to him nearly every day. Now, a year ago, 
I asked the then president-elect during the transition about why it was that he was only taking an intelligence briefing about once a week. Here's what he said. You know, I'm like a smart person. I don't have to be told the same thing and the same words every single day for the next eight years. Could be eight years, but eight years. I don't need that. And yesterday morning, Mr. Trump fired back at questions about his mental fitness with this tweet. Throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being like really smart. Not smart, but genius and a very stable genius at that. I, I say this respectfully, sir, and I understand your impatience with our dealing with this subject. The CIA does psychological profiles of world leaders routinely. What would you say about a world leader who refers to himself as a very stable genius? Chris, I'm not going to dignify that question with a response. This, this is a man who is leading the United States of America and who engages with the intelligence community in ways that are sophisticated. He deals with the most complex issues and is handling them in a way that I, I have great admiration and respect for. We're keeping America safe and the President Trump is completely capable of working alongside of us and leading us in that effort. I, I, I want to pick up on that last point. You say you're keeping America safe. By raising questions about the president's fitness, in a sense, and the president became a part of it, making this the big topic this week, has this book weakened our country, weakened our standing around the world? No. All right, let's move on. Let's turn to these protests in Iran uh, against the government. The Revolutionary Guard says this morning that they have put these demonstrations down. One, is that true? And two, what do you make of the fact that our closest European allies failed to support us when we tried to rally around the, the protesters? Well, Chris, this, this issue with the protests in Iran is very real. Uh, the economic conditions in Iran are not good. That's what caused the people to take to the streets. Uh, President Trump made very clear that America supports the Iranian people and is looking for them to have a voice and better economic and living conditions. Meanwhile, the Iranian regime threatens violence. Qasem Soleimani wastes their money in places like Lebanon and Syria and Yemen, trying to foment goodness knows what making them the world's largest state sponsor of terror. Look, that is a backward-looking regime. It is a theocratic re regime that is looking backwards instead of a regime that is looking forward to making the lives of their people better. Uh, whether it's Rouhani, who himself uh, in 1999 crushed violent revolts, or uh, Soleimani, pick a leader, or whether it's the Ayatollah, each of them views themselves as running a theocracy, and the Iranian people don't want that. And so it is my full expectation that you'll see the Iranian people continue to revolt against this. All right. Well, let me ask you a couple of specific questions. Have the authorities, the repressive authorities of the Iranian regime, have they put down the protest? So they're still going on at a low level. Um, there has certainly been uh, a violence that has taken place. That is, the regime has used force to push back against it. Uh, but it's my expectation these protests uh, are not behind us. Uh, secondly, uh, the Iranian state prosecutor has said that this is all the work of the CIA, and he talked specifically about your top man on the Iran desk. It's false. This was the Iranian people, started by them, created by them, continued by them demanding a better set of living conditions and a break from the theocratic regime that has uh, been with them since 1979. You have been very clear in your statements about the regime. President Trump has been, if anything, even clearer about it. Why is it that our top European allies failed to support us on this? And in fact, France, when we brought it up before the emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council, joined with Russia and China and said, this isn't a fit subject to bring up at the UN Security Council. Yeah, they'll have to answer for their behavior. But my sense is that um, we are in the same position. That is, I think when I talk to my counterparts in, in Europe, um, th they are with us in working to figure out ways uh, to counter Iran's malign behavior throughout the world. And indeed, we are working together with them in that effort. The president faces some deadlines in the next 10 days as to whether or not to stay in the Iran deal or to reimpose sanctions. Congress is working on legislation. Could they do something over these next 10 days that would make it sensible and reasonable for us to stay in the Iran deal? 
They could, Chris. I, I, I've, I've only seen a little bit of this. It's not in, in my lane directly. Um, they, they could do something. They could take some of the weaknesses from the agreement, from the Joint Comprehensive Agreement, uh, extend deadlines, put uh, snapback sanctions in a place where they could really happen. So there are a set of things they could do to make that deal better. And then ultimately, the president will have to make the decision about whether to remain in the deal or not. Now, when you talk about the changes they can make, one of them would be supposedly that they would basically say that that we the firm deadlines as to when we can do it. We would remove some of the timelines and say if they meet certain thresholds, then the sanctions go back in place. That, that's right, Chris. And then there are other things. The the agreement itself covered only. A, a set of malign behaviors, their nuclear program. There are other things which present real threats to America and to the world uh, that I hope we can all counter together. One more trouble spot. This week, uh, North Korean and South Korean officials are going to hold their first official talks in two years to discuss relations just ahead of the Winter Olympics. Uh, this was the initial reaction, the negative reaction from our UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. We won't take any of the talk seriously if they don't do something to ban all nuclear weapons in North Korea. Are these talks a good thing, or do you see them, your best CIA estimate, as an effort, and this is, wouldn't be the first time, by North Korea to try to drive a wedge between South Korea and its alliance with the United States? Yeah, look, it, the, the, the North Koreans are in a tough spot. President Trump has made very clear that the U.S. policy is denuclearization of the peninsula and that we're going to achieve that. Uh, so you see the North Koreans doing what they have historically done, reaching out, trying to find space, uh, trying to come up for air when they're being strangled by a president who's made very clear that their behavior is unacceptable. And so, yes, this is certainly part of that. We'll see how the talks go on Tuesday of this week uh, and what they're able to resolve with respect to the Olympics. But the American position is unchanged. But it, you sound in your answer as if you have grave skepticism about the question as to how sincere North Korea is in trying to improve relations. The North Koreans are behaving out of fear. That is, they are very concerned that America for the first time in an awfully long time is serious about need denuclearizing, denuclearizing the peninsula. And I think they're finding, trying to find a foothold, trying to find a place to reach out. And we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how the conversation's going to. Final question. Uh, Kim Jong-un, the head of the regime, in his New Year's Day statement where he reached out and talked about wanting to deal with South Korea, he also talked about the fact that he had a nuclear button on his desk, and President Trump responded with this tweet. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved food regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works? Question, how is that helpful? to get in this back and forth of taunts with a leader whom you and the CIA judge as unstable. This is the first time in an awfully long time that American policy has been consistent. That tweet is entirely consistent with what we're trying to communicate. We want the regime to understand that unlike before, we are intent on resolving this, and it is our firm conviction that resolving this diplomatically is the correct answer but that this administration is prepared to do what it takes to ensure that people in Los Angeles and Denver and New York aren't held at risk from Kim Jong-un having a nuclear weapon. That tweet is entirely consistent with that policy. And, and, and just quickly, how do you respond to people who are very critical of the tweet and say, you know, it, it lowers the threshold, it trivializes the possibility of nuclear war? Yeah, I just, just simply disagree with them. Uh, we, we in this administration understand the seriousness of what it is we're undertaking there. We understand the threat. We speak, I speak with the president about it nearly every day. Um, but we are intent upon laying out a set of plans that achieve the goal that, frankly, previous administrations have been unprepared to engage in. Director Pompeo, thank you. Thanks for your time this weekend. Thank you, Chris. Always good to talk with you, sir. Good to talk to you, too, sir. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss the Trump agenda for 2018 and the impact of a book that questions the president's fitness. We are very well prepared for the coming year. We finished very strong. President Trump laying out Republican plans for 2018 after meeting with GOP leaders this weekend at Camp David. And it's time now for our Sunday group, GOP strategist Carl Rove, Rachel Bade, who covers Congress for Politico, Julie Pace, Washington bureau chief for the Associated Press, and Guy Benson of townhall.com. Carl, 
I gather you, like like I, was ripping through the book. I stayed up till 11 o'clock on fr uh, Friday night. What do you make of the book, and what does it tell you about President Trump and his team in the White House? Well, if you didn't like Trump, you're not going to like him any better. And if you like Trump, you're going to dismiss a lot in the book. But not since that Vietnamese monk poured gasoline on himself in an intersection in Saigon in 1963 and lit a match have we seen someone immolate themselves as Steve Bannon did in this book. It is clear that this book was based on a large number of interviews taped with Steve Bannon by Michael Wolff, including uh, chapter 21, where all of these ugly things that he says about Trump's family are at a dinner with Wolf in his apartment in Arlington, and there's clearly a tape recorder running. So the, the biggest victim of this book, uh, by the book itself, uh, is, is, is Steve Bannon. His, his glory hopes of organizing a movement, raising ton, millions of dollars, backing candidates against every Senate Republican incumbent against Ted Cruz, and maybe running himself for president in 2020 if Trump didn't run all of these uh, de desires and dreams, poof, up in smoke. Yeah, briefly, because I want to bring everybody else in. Bannon, whatever you think of him, you one would think he's a rational guy. Why would he do this? Uh, because he's got a gigantic ego. Let me say one other quick thing. Uh, the, the problem for the president is not this book. It's his own quotes. It's, it's, it, the, 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 it's not, it, it is not the book, it's his behavior. And going out and issuing a tweet saying, I have, I'm a very stable genius and I'm like really smart was not helpful. It elongated the book, drew more attention to it, and dominated the conversation when there were better things for him to talk about than, than when, when, when we say something like that, it caused people to say, well, why are you so defensive about it? And the question is, why did the president feel compelled to be defensive about this book? Well, I want to pick up on that with you, Julie, because this book comes out just as the president was riding pretty high with the passage of the tax bill, with a long list of good economic news. How much has the book and the president's reaction to it, thrown them off their game as they prepare for what's going to be a tough month, very tough month, with the, the we'll, we'll get to it in a second, but the government running out of money in 12 days and a very challenging midterm election year. It's overshadowed everything that Republicans on the Hill and White House advisors had hoped to spend this week talking about. There was no effort made, no serious effort made by the White House this week to sell the public on the tax overhaul, which is pretty unpopular right now, and they're going to have to bolster its popularity if Republicans hope to run on it in the fall. There was no effort to lay the groundwork uh, publicly on a spending bill. Very little public conversation about immigration and DACA or the border wall. And you know, to Carl's point, this book, based on the content of it, was always going to be news. But it would not have reached this level if it hadn't been for the president coming out and putting out a statement, going after Steve Bannon, if it hadn't been for the tweets yesterday. So much of the coverage of this is driven by the president's own actions. That's something that's fully within his control. And he cannot avoid a fight. If he sees somebody going after him personally, he feels like he has to get in there. He has to mix it up. He does not feel like, as president, he is above uh, squabbling with even a former advisor. Not to mention uh, something that was almost unprecedented which is having his lawyers threaten to sue Steve Bannon and the publisher and uh, Michael Wolf, the author, which, again, was just like, thank you, Mr. President, if I'm the publisher Absolutely. of that book. As I said, the, the first key government deadline is to find a way to keep the government funded in 12 days or else we're going to have a shutdown. Democrats say no deal on spending unless there is a deal on DACA and the Dreamers. And yesterday at his meeting with Republican leaders at Camp David, President Trump laid out his conditions for that. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. Very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. Rachel, Democrats say, OK, we can go for border security, but we're not going to go for a wall. And we found out in the last couple of days that the administration is saying the cost of the wall just for the first phase would be $18 billion over 10 years. So how in the next 12 days can they make an agreement to keep the government funded when you've got all these conditions about, yes, DACA, no wall, yes, there has to be a wall? 
Yeah, I think everybody on the Hill is asking the exact same question right now. Democrats long saying um, they want this done before they agree to a long-term budget deal. The problem here is that the president wants something that they're not going to be able to approve or vote for. We heard this week that two Senate Republicans in um, this bipartisan working group that everybody thought would come up with a bipartisan DACA deal actually walked away from the table. Tom Tillis of North Carolina, James Lakeford of Oklahoma, they left because they said Democrats are not willing to give anything on border security. Meanwhile, you have the president sort of doubling down on his partisan rhetoric in terms of demanding the wall. I'm not sure how this is going to come together. I am skeptical, however, that Democrats are going to take this to a shutdown in late January because they had a chance to do that before in December, and they blinked, and they voted for a short-term spending bill. I, I am skeptical that they're going to hold the line on this. We'll just have to see. So, so I just want to be clear here, because the, the immigration people and the Hispanics are saying, you, you, this is your time for leverage. You've got to get this as part of the spending deal. You're suggesting the Democrats won't do that. You know, they said that they were going to do this as part of before Christmas, that they were not going to support any kind of spending deal um, or agreement before they left for the holiday break. And yet there were a number of Democrats in the Senate who voted for a short-term spending bill. So I think that there are a lot of Republicans who thought this was the hill that Democrats were willing to die on and that they would have to cave to Democratic demands on DACA. The sense I'm getting now from Republicans is that they think maybe they could push this off, get a spending deal, and deal with it later in March. Guy, uh, there's also a split that we saw this week within the Republican Party. You have House Speaker Ryan, who continues to push for welfare reform, but the reports this week are that the president and Senate leader McConnell have cooled on that and want to lead with infrastructure. Do you have any sense of the order the, with the priorities? And, and what are the chances, particularly because you're going to need Democratic votes, for any serious legislation this year? Well, much better chance uh, for Democrats to hop on board an infrastructure bill than a uh, spending reform bill or welfare reform. So when I was talking to top House Republican sources prior to the new year, they were saying, oh, yes, you know, we're doing the tax cuts. It's going to be a great deal for the American people. And then we need some fiscal discipline. We're going to get to welfare reform next. And I was always skeptical, saying, hey, you know, the president's appetite for that sort of thing has always seemed very limited. He came out on the campaign trail hard against entitlement reform. Is he really going to follow up a tax bill with something like welfare reform? And it seems like he's really backing off of that, with Mitch McConnell being his conduit on Capitol Hill, saying, uh, let's talk about infrastructure spending instead. That might be an easier lift in an election year. Which, which raises another question, Carl. The, the first midterm election for the party that has the president in office is always tough, with the exception of you in 2002 with George W. Bush. How much trouble are Republicans in as they head towards the midterm in 2018 in November? Big trouble. The president's approval rating is in the high 30s, and uh, the Republicans are 24 seats in the House away from losing their majorities. I, as a result, I think we're going to see two Republican uh, agendas in 2018. We're going to see the unified Republican agenda, House, Senate, and White House, which is going to focus on infrastructure and maybe a doc a deal and a couple other things. And then we're going to see a House Republican agenda in which they do tackle things like poverty and welfare reform so that the members have the ability to go home and say, we passed it, I voted for it, and it's now bollocks up in the Senate. There's always been a tension between the House and the Senate. This year, the House Republicans are going to use that tension creatively in order to say, we're working, they are, vote for the Repub me, your Republican congressman, and the Senate can go to heck. I'm glad you cleaned it up that way. All right. Thank you, panel. We'll see, take a break here. Uh, we'll see you guys a little bit later. When we come back, Corey Lewandowski, President Trump's first campaign manager and still a top outside advisor on that controversial new book and Steve Bannon's sudden fall from power. A look outside the Beltway at Savannah, Georgia, after its heaviest snowfall in three decades. Back now to the fallout from Michael Wolf's book on the Trump presidency. Joining us from Manchester, New Hampshire, President Trump's first campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, who is now chief strategist for America First Action, a pro-Trump super PAC. Corey, what do you think of the book and how accurate is it? Well, Chris, let me first say Happy New Year, and let me be very clear. This is a book of fiction. Not only is it not accurate, uh, there are so many misrepresentations in this book that it shouldn't be taken seriously. And if you look at the critics of Mr. Wolf, 
his contemporaries, his colleagues, the New York Times, CNN, clearly not people who have been friendly or supportive of this president or his administration. They have called into question the simple facts that are in this book as factually inaccurate. And Mr. Wolf himself claimed at the very beginning of the book that it looks like he's taken liberties to put things in the book that may not have happened, but he lets the reader decide. That is not journalistic integrity, and this book is a complete fabrication. All right. But here's one excerpt of the book where Michael Wolf describes your relationship with the president's two sons, Don Jr. and Eric, and also Jared Kushner. Let's put it up. Lewandowski regarded both brothers and their brother-in-law with rolling on the floor contempt. Not only were Don Jr. and Eric stupid, and Jared both supercilious and obsequious, the butler, but nobody knew a whit about politics. Fact is, you didn't think much of Don Jr., who helped force you out as campaign manager. You know, Chris, it's, it's very important to know Mr. Wolf and I never spoke about this book. So where he comes up with these uh, assertions of what I think of the Trump kids or, or Jared Kushner are completely made up. I've never spoken to him about this. And so let me be as clear as I can be. And, and look, I talk about this in my book. I think Eric and Don are, are fantastic advocates for their father. I have a very close working relationship with Jared Kushner. I respect what he has done by leaving his business and coming to government service. So these, are, again, are made up. Up accusations from a person who never spoke to me about my opinion of anybody in the Trump orbit or the Trump family. Well, okay, but but one could argue that your views of some of these people we just talked about are, were known to other people. I, I, I have a lot of respect for you, uh, Corey, but your discretion and your and your <laughs> your lack of giving your views is not one of the things that I necessarily agree with. Let me ask you another question, honestly. Did you ever refer, refer to Jared as the butler? Look, I, Chris, I've never done that. And that's such, you know, that's such conjecture. It's such speculation. It shouldn't have ever been printed. And, and, and like I heard on the entire chapter that this guy wrote about the CPAC event, he never called Matt Schlapp at CPAC or anybody else to talk about it. He never called me. I never sat down. So for him to say I called anybody anything without talking to me is an injustice to the integrity of, of publishing a book. The guy's a liar is what it comes down to. And I don't think anybody who looks at what is in this book can take it on. Honestly. So look, Chris, I've been very clear. I don't think I should have been fired by the Trump campaign after helping to steer the candidate through 38 primaries and caucuses and help him get more votes than any candidate than the history of the Republican Party. But the family made a decision to have me moved out in June of 2016, and that was a decision that we've now lived with. But the bottom line is, I never spoke to Wolf. And whether, you know, was I disappointed in June of 2016? You bet I was. But have I done everything humanly possible from that day to make sure the Trump agenda moves forward? whether it was uh, right after that, right after I left the campaign on television or to this day on the outside, you bet I have. You also think that if you hadn't been fired, Trump would have won more than 306 electoral votes. Well, look, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to say that I could have maybe helped deliver New Hampshire because uh, selfishly, I want to see him win my home state and I wanted to see him win Nevada. It was an amazing election victory that Donald Trump gets all the credit for. But I do think there could have obviously been a role for me at that campaign had I not been asked to leave. OK, let's get to the to the central point here. Michael Wolf basically says that all the people around the president question his fitness to be the commander in chief. Here he is. The one description that that everyone gave, everyone has in common, they all say he is like a child. And what they mean by that is he has an, a need for immediate gratification. It's all about him. Your reaction. Chris, I spend 18 hours a day, seven days a week for almost two years next to candidate Trump. And I've had the high privilege of continuing to speak to the president as uh, as he has assumed that office. And I can tell you this. Never have I seen anything like this. Michael Wolf hasn't spent any time with the candidate. He wasn't with us on the campaign trail. He hasn't been next to the president while he's been in the Oval Office making decisions. And if you look at what this man has achieved throughout his lifetime, it's not instant gratification. It's long-term success, whether it has been books or television or running for office. You know, it was two years ago this very week, three, excuse me, three years ago this very week, I joined the Trump organization, the Trump team, to start planning that run for president. That's not instant gratification. And what Donald Trump achieved in that campaign 
was unparalleled success against an amazing field of Republican candidates that took two long years of dedication and hard work by candidate Trump to do something nobody ever thought he could do, and Wolf was anywhere near that. All right, uh, look, I want to make it clear because I've talked a long time to you. Uh, you. You say it was two years ago that I did a power player on you. Uh, we've talked often since then. I've read your book, and clearly your admiration for Donald Trump I I is there. And the, in no way do you question his fitness. In fact, quite the contrary, you, you basically say he's he's kind of a genius. I don't know. I forget whether you use those words or. Or not, but you also do talk about some behavior that is questionable, and I want to I want to discuss that uh, because that's also part of your description of him. You say the four major food groups on Trump Force One were McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, pizza, and Diet Coke. And here's what you say about what happens when the president often or then candidate would lose his temper. The mode that he switches into when things aren't going his way can feel like an all-out assault. It'd break most hardened men and women into little pieces. Around the campaign, we'd call it getting your face ripped off. Corey, you talk about one instance when the president got so upset, he's in a helicopter, you're, I, I think you're in the helicopter with him, that he orders the pilot to fly it down so low that he can get cell phone service so he can chew out Paul Manafort. Well, Chris, look, having your face ripped off by the president, as we describe it, is because we failed as a staff. This is a man who woke up every day and put 18 or 20 hours a day in every day on the campaign trail. And when something didn't go right, it wasn't because he wasn't giving 125 percent effort. It's because the staff failed him. The microphone didn't work properly. Something that we should have had done for him wasn't right. And that's the accountability. He expects, demands, and deserves the best. And he should have that. And when I I failed as a campaign manager. He let me know. It makes me a better person for that. I didn't take it personally. I wanted to work harder because I saw what he was doing, and I forced our staff to work harder so that he got the very best. There's nothing wrong with that, Chris. I took that as a level of professionalism that forced me and my team to be better because that's what he deserved. Chris, you have to remember. At the, at the significant early stage of this campaign, there were four or five people against the Republican juggernauts, right? Against the Bush campaign, right. the Walker campaign, the Cruz campaign, where they had hundreds of people. We were doing I, this with a much smaller team. And so what we had to do is we had to be perfect every day. And when we weren't, he held us accountable, and that's the right thing to do. Okay. I've got about two minutes. I want to get into one last subject with you. Let's talk about accountability. Steve Bannon, uh, you have generally gotten along with him. Uh, how do you explain him accusing Don Jr. Uh, and Jared of treason for their meeting with uh, that Russian lawyer in June of 2016 at Trump Tower, and also suggesting that some of them may have been involved, including Jared and money laundering? How do you explain him being so indiscreet? Look, I, I can't explain that. There's no justification for that whatsoever. I know Don Jr. I know Jared Kushner. They're American patriots. Uh, Don loves his country. Jared loves his country. They have given up so much to help this I'm country. I'm not talking be about better. them. I'm and talking so, about Steve Bannon. Why would he do that? Look, I, 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 can't, I can't justify what Steve said. If that's what Steve said, then he owes, he owes Donald Trump, he owes Donald Trump Jr., he owes Jared Kushner and the entire Trump family an apology if that's what he said. And if that's what he said, then shame on Steve Bannon because that is so out of bounds to accuse somebody of treason is so out of line, so out of uh, character for a guy like Steve Bannon that I, I have a hard time believing what Wolf wrote. But if that's what Steve said, then shame on Steve for doing that because that is way out of line. Final question, because here was the president at Camp David yesterday on both the author Michael Wolf and also on Steve Bannon. Here he is. I never interviewed with him in the White House at all. He was never in the Oval Office. We didn't have an interview. Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite a bit, and it was one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. The president says he and Bannon are done. The, the Mercers, the conservative billionaire backers, said they've got no more dealings with Steve Bannon. 30 seconds. What is Steve Bannon's place in Republican politics now? Well, look, Chris, the only person that's ahead of the Republican Party is, is the president of the United States, Donald Trump. And people, 60 million people voted for him, and they didn't vote for Steve Bannon or Becca Mercer or anybody else to be the president of the United States. They voted for Donald Trump. So if Steve Bannon wants to get on the Trump team and join with the president to make sure that we hold the House 